Darwin's Doubt, Part 9. We've been going through the book Darwin's Doubt. Uh, written by Steve Meyer, PhD. He's author of Signature in the Cell. Started out life as an oil industry geophysicist and then switched to the origin of life and uh, got a PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science. He is now the director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute and uh, this book is, act, uh, is actually a, a, an expansion and further elaboration of, uh, with new material of course, of Meyer's uh, article that uh, got uh, Richard Sternberg in trouble at the Smithsonian. That's the uh, jacket of the book. The prologue outlines that the book is divided into three main parts. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal, which we just finished last week. And then part three, after Darwin, what? And uh, we're just starting on part three. To review, <coughs> the story so far is that the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. And the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Qingjing fossils. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. Uh, claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. Uh, genetics seems to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed. The tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion because it has its own defects and punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion. Part two outlines the reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinism. Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, uh, but functional information, information that makes a difference. There's always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made that job much more daunting. Steve Meyer uh, then wrote a paper called, uh, calling, that called attention to this work, the paper we just uh, referenced, uh, only to see the paper put on a figurative index was it was basically retracted in toto, not by him, of course, and Richard Sp Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated. Uh, Sternberg now works for the Discovery Institute. The only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article, and Meyer takes that article apart, showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't say what the article said it says. New developments in population genetics have made much more clear the magnitude of the barriers to getting even small changes in DNA that are advantageous, especially in multicellular animals. Basically, for multicellular animals that are in the order of mammals, you're allowed, uh, perhaps by chance, one multi-step, and that's it. <coughs> and th even that is asking uh, for special pleading. Developmental gene regulatory networks, or DGRNs, which can't change significantly without damaging or killing the creature, but must change to give rise to a new body plan. And epigenetic information also challenged Darwinism, and that's where we finished last week. And then we're now into part three, after Darwin, what? First uh, chapter is on the post-Darwinian world and self-organization. The year 2009 marked the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. In that year, the renowned Cambrian paleontologist Simon Conway Morris published an essay in the journal Current Biology titled, Walcott, the Burgess Shale, and Rumors of a Post-Darwinian World assessing the current state of evolutionary biology. 
quote, everywhere elsewhere in the origin, the arguments slide one by one skillfully into place. The towering edifice rises and the creationists are left permanently in its shadow, he wrote, but not when it comes to the seemingly abrupt appearance of animal fossils. Instead, which is of course why the title of the book Darwin's Doubt, instead, Unresolved problems exposed by the Cambrian explosion have, in Conway Morris's view, opened the way to a post-Darwinian world. The evidence we reviewed in the previous sections of the book, evidence for a real rather than merely apparent explosion of animal form in the fossil record, and against the neo-Darwinian mechanism as an explanation for the origin of form and information, may help to explain why biology has begun to enter such a world. Moreover, any doubts that at least some biologists have begun to embrace a post-Darwinian perspective should have been laid to rest in the summer of 2008, when 16 influential evolutionary biologists met for a private conference at the Konrad Lorenz Institute in Altenburg, Austria. The scientists, whom the science media later dubbed the Altenburg 16, met to explore the future of evolutionary theory. These biologists had many different and sometimes conflicting ideas about how new forms of life might have evolved, but all were united by the conviction that the neo-Darwinian synthesis had run its course and that new evolutionary mechanisms were needed to explain the origin of biological form. As paleontologist Graham Budd, who was in attendance, explained, when the public thinks about evolution, they think about things like the origin of wings, but these are things that evolutionary theory has told us little about. Quite a confession. Now, it would be nice if that was taught in public school. Of course, explaining the origin of form is precisely what has made the Cambrian explosion so mysterious. In chapter 7, in discussing the idea of punctuated equilibrium, I quoted Cambrian paleontologists James Valentine and Douglas Irwin who concluded exactly that. They argued that neither punctuated equilibrium nor neo-Darwinism has accounted for the origin of new body plans and that consequently biology needs a new theory to explain the evolution of novelty. The Altenberg 16 sought to address this challenge. Since the conference and for nearly two decades preceding it, many evolutionary biologists have been working to formulate new theories of evolution or at least new ideas about evolutionary mechanisms with more creative power than mutation and natural selection alone. Each of these new theories attempts to answer the increasingly urgent question after Darwin or Neo-Darwinism. What? The Neo-Darwinian triad. The Neo-Darwinian mechanism rests on three core claims. First, that evolutionary change occurs as a result of random, minute variations or mutations. Second, that the process of natural selection sifts among these variations and mutations such a, that some organisms leave more offspring than others, that is, differential reproduction. And third, favored variations must be inherited faithfully in subsequent generations of organisms, thus causing the population in which they reside to change or evolve over time. Um, again, I'm uh, giving the Reader's Digest version. You see ellipses. That means I've omitted something. You can read it in the original in the book itself. And uh, there'll be a lot of things, some of which I'll omit and uh, will actually be worthwhile talking about, but we just don't have time to go through it all. Uh, if I'm going to give any kind of time for comments and questions. Those evolutionary biologists who now doubt orthodox neo-Darwinian theory typically question or reject one or more of the elements of this neo-Darwinian triad. See figure 16.1, we're going to see that uh, in a little while. Eldridge and Gould questioned Darwinian gradualism, which led them to reject the idea that mutational change occurs in minute increments that is, the first element of the neo-Darwinian triad just mentioned. And we'll discuss that at the beginning of the next chapter. Other evolutionary biologists have since rejected other core elements of the neo-Darwinian mechanism and sought to replace them with other mechanisms or processes. 
This chapter will examine a new class. Models that attempt to explain the origin of biological form by de-emphasizing the role of random mutations. These models instead emphasize the importance of self-organizational laws or processes. And we're going to discuss primarily Kaufman and Newman and, and uh, who are related. Well before the Altenberg 16 convened, a significant number of evolutionary theorists had already begun to explore alternatives to the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Punctuated equilibrium was one such alternative. But as scientific criticisms of that theory began to mount during the 1980s and 1990s, a group of scientists associated with the think tank in New Mexico, the Santa Fe Institute, developed a new theoretical approach. They called it self-organization. Whereas neo-Darwinism Neo explains the origin of biological form and structure as the consequences of natural selection acting on random mutations, self-organizational theorists suggest that biological form often arises, or as they put it, self-organizes, spontaneously as a consequence of the laws of nature, or laws of form. Natural selection, they theorize, acts to preserve this spontaneously arising order, Thus, they de-emphasize two of the three parts of the classical neo-Darwinian triad, random mutations and, to a lesser extent, natural selection. In 1993, the most prominent scientists associated with the Santa Fe Institute, former University of Pennsylvania biochemist Stuart Kaufman, released an eagerly awaited treatise, The Origin of Order, Self-Organization and Selection in Evolution. Kaufman articulated a trenchant critique of the creative power of the mutation and selection mechanism. Um, not that unlike to uh, what uh, Steve Meyer has offered. Kaufman advanced a comprehensive th alternative theory to account for the emergence of new form. In addition, he advanced a specific proposal for explaining the Cambrian explosion. And uh, you'll notice that all this is heavily referenced, so if you want to go back to the original, you can, which is one of the strengths of this particular work. Kaufman proposes first that gene regulatory networks in animal cells, that's a DGRN that you've heard about, uh, genes that regulate other genes, influence cell differentiation. They do this by generating predictable pathways of differentiation patterns by which one type of cell will emerge from another over the course of embryological development as the cells divide. Kaufman makes a similar case for the importance of self-organizational processes during body plan morphogenesis, the second phase of animal development. This phase involves not so much the differentiation of one cell type from another, but the arrangement and organization of different cell types into the distinct tissues and organs that jointly constitute various animal body plans. Epigenetic information, and again there's a bunch of stuff that I'm omitting, uh, by recognizing the importance of su such information, Kaufman also rejects the neo-Darwinian assumption that a genetic program entirely determines animal development. He further regards the patterns of development that result from this positional information as evidence of self-ordering tendencies in matter and the existence of the law of laws of biological form. And he's probably partly right in that. Last part. Um, do these self-ordering tendencies or laws of form, if they exist, explain the origin of animal body plans and the information necessary to build them, uh, according to Steve Meyer, they don't. Self-organization and epigenetic information. To see why, let's look first at how Kaufman attempts to explain the epigenetic positional information that directs the organization of cells in the second phase of animal development. Kaufman invokes an idea sketched out in the 1940s by the famous English mathematician Alan Turing, uh, this is uh, computer fame. 
Uh, Turing proposed that specific arrangements of cells in animal development might ultimately derive from the diffusion and specific arrangement of crucial molecules, presumably something like the morphogen proteins present in embryonic cells. Turing postulated that the distribution of these molecules might have originated in the first place independently of such information, uh, the information that is of pre-existing and genetic, pre-existing genetic and, inf and epigenetic information, as the result of simple chemical reactions. That's my insertion, but uh, otherwise you don't know what such means. But it uh, it is quoting uh, the book. Kaufman expanded upon this proposal as a way of understanding how crucial positional information might organize as a result of chemical interactions of different molecules. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, his proposal suffers from an obvious difficulty. It lacks any chemical or biological specificity. In other words, it's saying, no, this kind of thing could happen, this kind of thing could happen, but never says, in this animal it happens in this way, and these are the molecules involved. It's... Uh, uh, close to fact-free science. No. Kaufman himself seems tacitly to acknowledge the difficulty of generating biological specificity from the reactions of chemicals alone. He notes in critique of his own model that patterns of molecular diffusion produced by chemical autocatalysis would depend crucially upon the initial conditions. And in other words, the original epigenetic and genetic information. Um, Kaufman encounters this same problem in attempting to explain the origin of the first life as the result of autocatalytic reactions starting from a prebiotic stoop. In The Origin of Order, he acknowledges that generating an autocatalytic or self-reproducing set of molecules a crucial step in his origin of life scenario would require, quote, high molecular specificity, end quote, in the initial set of peptides or RNA molecules. In other words, it would require specificity of arrangement and structure, that is to say, functional information. self-organization and, and genetic information. And what about the specificity of gener genetic information necessary to the earlier phase of animal development? Does Kaufman's self-organizational theory explain the origin of the genetic regulatory networks necessary to cell differentiation? Again, it does not. Instead, in an even more obvious way, it begs the question of the origin of these regulatory networks. Indeed, though Kaufman dis discusses cell differentiation as a kind of self-ordering or self-organizational process, he acknowledges that the predictable pathways of differentiation that characterize this process derive from pre-existing gene regulatory networks. And uh, then there's a whole section on computer simulations and buttons connected by strings, and they have to be... Uh, very carefully adjusted so that they, they are what uh, Kaufman would call in the edge of chaos. If they're too orderly, you don't get it, that kind of complexity you need. If they're too disorderly, again, you don't get the kind of complexity you need. He has a system of many interconnected lights. In, in both of his examples, Kaufman presupposes significant sources of pre-existing information. In his buttons and string simulation, he, ten, he intends the buttons to represent proteins, themselves the result of pre-existing genetic information. Where did that information come from? Kaufman doesn't say. But it is an essential part of what needs the explanation in the history of life. Similarly, in his light system, the programmer <laughs> tunes the system to keep it from either generating an excessively rigid order or devolving into chaos. Kaufman on the Cambrian. Kaufman also predicts, proposes a special, specific self-organizational mechanism to retain, explain some aspects of the Cambrian explosion. 
According to Kaufman, new Cambrian animals e emerge through long jump mutations that establish new body forms, new body plants in a discrete rather than gradual fashion. <coughs> Shades of uh, Schindewolf, huh? <coughs> Kaufman's proposal begs the most important <coughs> question. What produced the new Cambrian body plants in the first place? By invoking, quote, long jump mutations, end quote, he identifies no specific self-organizational process that can produce such changes. Moreover, he concedes a principle that undermines his own proposal. As noted above, Kaufman acknowledges that mutations early in development are almost inevitably deleterious. They, they kill the organism, basically. Developmental toolkits and self-organizational processes. More recently, Stuart Newman, a cell biologist at the New York Medical College and one of the participants at the Altenburg 16 conference, Newman develops a model that, re rep that resembles Kaufman's, but one that offers more biological specificity. So it's a, an improvement, apparently. Newman, like Kaufman, invokes self-organizational processes, but Newman sees these processes acting dynamically and in coordination with the genetic toolkit. His model emphasizes the importance of a highly conserved, that is, a similar set of regulatory genes in all the major Cambrian taxa. In his view, this common developmental genetic toolkit has been useful, used to generate animal body plans and organ forms for more than half a billion years since the inception of the animal kingdom. Although most of the work was done in a very short period of geological time, assuming the standard uh, geologic time scale. But if all the animal taxa have the same toolkit, why are the various forms of animals and higher metazoan taxa so different from one another? In other words, now, now you've explained some, that there's some similarity, but now why are they different? For Newman, the answer to this question requires understanding how self-organizing processes influence the interaction of cells during development and how they cause genes to acquire different, functioning, different functions affecting the interactions of cells. Do these self-organizational processes account for the origin of animal body plans in the Cambrian explosion or the information necessary to produce new animal forms? Again, they do not. Instead, Newman, like Kaufman, either fails to offer an adequate mechanism for generating crucial sources of biological information, or he begs the question by presupposing the existence of various sources of information. Assume a toolkit. In the first place, Newman obviously presupposes the, the existence of a developmental genetic toolkit. That is, a whole set of genes, including regulatory genes, that helps to direct the development of animal body plants. Where does this genetic information come from? He doesn't specify. Though, <coughs> though presumably, he might be assuming the neo-Darwinian mechanism somehow produced the genetic information in the toolkit. Producing a body plan from the different types of cell clusters generating by Newman, uh, generated by Newman's dynamical patterning mo modules would also require additional information. Newman does not account for this information. There's yet a further problem with Newman's proposal. Even the capacity for cells to self-organize into dynamical patterning mo modules probably derives from prior unexplained sources of information. And there's the question of order versus information. Self-organizational theories face, in addition, a conceptual distinction that has cast doubt on the relevance of their theories to, to biological systems. Self-organizational theorists seek to explain the origin of order in living systems by reference to purely, purely physical or chemical processes or laws describing these processes. But what needs to be explained in living systems is not mainly order in the sense of simple repetitive or geometric patterns, Instead, what requires explanation is the adaptive complexity and the information genetic and, e and epigenetic necessary to build it. And uh, here's an illustration of order. <coughs> <coughs> 
uh, one line of a salt crystal will have alternating sodium and chloride. And of course, if you go down, you also have alternating uh, sodium and chloride. And if you go in and out of the page, you have sodium uh, and chloride alternating. Uh, you can have complexity, but without any particular uh, structure to it. And then you can have specified complexity as in the sentence, time and tide wait for no man. Also made out of letters just like uh, the first two, but with an entirely different characteristic. What does this all have to do with self-organization? Simply this. Law-like self-organizing processes that generate the kind of order present in a crystal or vortex do not also generate complex sequences or structures. Still less do they generate specified complexity, the kind of order present, present in a gene or functionally complex organ. Hubert Yaki first recognized the problems associated with invoking self-organization. These theories fail, he argued, for two reasons. First, they do not distinguish order from information. And second, the information in the DNA molecule does not derive from law-like forces of attraction. As he explained in 1977, attempts to relate the idea of order with biological organization or specificity must be regarded as a play on words that cannot stand careful scrutiny. Informational macromolecules can code genetic messages and therefore can carry information because the sequence of bases or residues is affected very little, if at all, by physiochemical factors. That is to say, <clears throat> if you have DNA and you have an A at the first position, there is no particular reason to have an A or a T or a G or a C at the second position. You can have whichever one you want. Without that flexibility, without that ability to simply put whatever you want, you can't have the information. If, for example, after an A you always had another A, you would have poly A and that would be all you could get. Much the same thing is true in many other, in many vital sources of epigenetic information. If you could, if you are uh, if the epigenetic information influences other epigenetic information, uh, then it restricts the, the variability that you can use and, and the coding that you can use to, to, uh, uh, to give epigenetic information. You would wind up with kind of your epigenetic information being dictated by uh, whatever the first molecule was. When Stephen Jay Gould, now we're moving on to past Newman to other models. When Stephen Jay Gould was first wrestling with the question of how new forms of animal life could have arisen so quickly in the fossil record, he considered many possible mechanisms of change. In the famed 1980 paper in which he declared neo-Darwinism effectively dead, he didn't just propose allopatric speciation and species selection as new evolutionary mechanisms. He also granted a rehearing to a long discredited idea. Specifically, he argued that large scale macro mutations might be, generate significant innovations in form relatively quickly. <coughs> now, this resurrected an old idea by Berkeley geneticist Richard Goldschmidt and German paleontologist. Otto Schindewolf, um, that the um, first bird hatched from a reptilian egg, is the way uh, Schindewolf put it, and thus in Goldschmidt's words, that the many missing links in the paleontological record are sought for in vain because they have never existed. That's one way of uh, explaining the missing links. They're real. Neo-Darwinists, of course, did not accept this. Goldschmidt's macromutations, they contended, would produce not what Goldschmidt called hopeful monsters, but 
hopeless monsters, that is, non-viable organisms. Though Gould wanted to reconsider a role for large-scale mutations, he carefully disassociated his proposal from Goldschmidt's much ridiculed idea. Other evolutionary biologists uh, have developed evolutionary developmental biology, or EvoDevo for short, and they developed alternative models that challenge a key aspect of the new Darwinian triad. Whereas neo-Darwinism envisions new forms arising as the result of slow incremental accumulations of minor mutations, evolutionary developmental biologists argue that mutations affecting genes involved in animal development can cause large-scale morphologic change and even whole new body plants. Each of these alternatives emphasizes certain elements of the triad at the expense of others. Whereas the self-organizational alternatives that I discussed in the last chapter emphasize the role of law-like processes over random mutations, these other new theories reaffirm the importance of mutations, though each also re reconceptualizes how mutations act. One approach falls under the rubric of evo-devo and conceives of mutations producing modifications in larger increments. Another, the neutral theory of evolution, sees mutations acting absent selection. Another, neo-Lamarckian epigenetic inheritance, envisions heritable alterations in epigenetic information influencing the future course of evolution. Still another, called natural genetic engineering, affirms that non-random genetic arrangements drive evolutionary innovation. And now we'll come to that figure 16.1, which the tenets of neo-Darwinian uh, theory, randomness and small-scale variations and mutations, natural selection, and heredity are the three pillars. And in fact, you'll have people say, well, if you've got random variations, well, do you? Yes. Uh, if you've got natural selection, differential re reproduction, well, do you? Yes. Well, if, you, if those changes are inheritable, then you have evolution. See, so evolution is proved, which means that we came from amoeba. Um, but you can see there are a lot of people who are challenging all kinds of uh, those. Symbiogenesis challenges all three. Natural genetic engineering challenges the first two. That is to say, the, the mutations, when we're going to come to that last, um, are engineered by the organism rather than just random. And of course, that also takes uh, part of natural selection's role. Neil Lamarckism uh, um, is argued and uh, dispenses with heredity because um, these are uh, environmental changes that are inherited. Facilitated variation and evolutionary developmental biology will challenge the small-scale variations or perhaps the randomness in the case of facilitated variation. And self-organization says that <coughs> it's not so much natural selection as that things can just kind of lock into place. And neutral evolution says, well, natural selection isn't that good at selecting out organisms. So you can see there's a number of different ways people have tried to, uh, uh, have tried to deal with uh, the facts knowing that standard neo-Darwinian theory just doesn't explain everything. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to see if uh, people were teaching evolution in school uh, that the uh, uninitiated were initiated not only into the standard theory, but into the fact that there are all these challenges to it. The neo-Darwinian synthesis, large-scale macroevolutionary changes occur as the inevitable byproduct of the accumulation of small-scale microevolutionary changes within populations. 
the consensus in support of this idea began to fray when uh, Gould, Niels Eldridge, and Stephen Stanley realized that the fossil record did not show a pattern of gradual micro-to-micro -micro change. In 1980, at a now famous symposium on macroevolution at the Field Museum in Chicago, the rebellion burst into, burst into full view, exposing what developmental biologist Scott Gilbert called an underground current in evolutionary theory among theorists who had concluded that, quote, macroevolution could not be derived from microevolution. And I want you to notice that these are people who know their evolutionary biology very well, but are not willing to state what many people will tell you is just the fact that if you believe in microevolution you have to believe in macroevolution too because it's the same process. These people say no it's not the same process. Despite the enthusiasm surrounding the field Evo Devo fails and for an obvious reason. This is of course Steve Meyer's critique of Evo Devo. Its main proposal that early acting developmental mutations can cause stable heritably, stably heritable large-scale changes in animal body plans contradicts the results of 100 years of mutagenesis experiments. As we saw in Chapter 13, the experiments of scientists such as Nisslein, uh, Volhart, and uh, Wieschaus. Uh, you may remember we talked about those where uh, uh, every time you try to get a you know, major uh, change, the larva doesn't survive. Or if it does survive, it survives in a crippled state that would, that would be rapidly eliminated by natural selection. So the problem is, you, you know, it's like, well, if you just walk across this bridge, but there is no bridge there. Well, what about Hox genes? And he deals with that. Experimentally generated mutations in Hox genes have proved harmful. William McGinnis and Michael Cusiora, two biologists who have studied the effects of mutations on Hox genes, have observed that in fruit flies, most mutations in homeotic, or Hox genes, cause fatal birth defects. And it's just uh, some fascinating material that we don't have time to go into on that subject. The same Hox genes, this is another interesting piece of Hox gene uh, material, um, as determined by nucleotide sequence homology. That is to say, you have the same gene in uh, a mouse, in a fruit fly, and in a echinoderm, a sea urchin. The same gene regulates the development of different anatomical features found in different phyla. For instance, in arthropods, fruit flies, for example, the Hox gene distal less is required for the normal development of jointed arthropod legs. You mutate that gene, they don't grow legs. But in vertebrates, a homologous gene is virtually identical. In fact, they've replaced these genes with the other gene and it still works. Is that close? The Dix gene in mice builds a different kind of non-homologous leg, an entirely different appendage, you know, with bones inside instead of outside, for example. Um, another homolog of the distal S gene in the echinoderms regulates the development of tube feet and <coughs> spines. Anatomical features classically thought not to be homologous to arthropod limbs, nor to the limbs of tetrapods. And um, then there's neutral or non-adaptive uh, evolution. Maybe things just kind of drifted along and, and, and um, natural selection isn't as powerful as we give it credit for. And this has been generally championed by uh, Michael Lynch, a geneticist at Indiana University. And he proposes a neutral or non-adaptive theory of evolution in which nat natural selection plays a largely insignificant role. Lynch has also advanced a powerful mathematical critique of the efficacy of ne the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Basically, 
um, natural selection isn't good enough. Uh, and some of his work is being used, I'm sure without his permission, by uh, Sanford to argue that natural selection can't even keep us where we are, that we're gradually deteriorating. As uh, for a critique of that, as my colleague Paul Nelson has put it rather colorfully, to get Lynch's theory of genomic accretion up and running, a great deal of complicated molecular machinery must be rolled in from off stage. That is, how do you get to the stage where you can now start drifting? Lynch does argue in one paper that neutral evolutionary processes can generate new complex adaptations, adaptations requiring multiple coordinated mutations within realistic waiting times. In particular, writing in a recent paper with colleague Adam Abegg of St. Louis University, he argues that, quote, conventional population genetic mechanisms, end quote, such as random mutation and genetic drift, can cause the relatively rapid re emergence of specific complex adaptations. Um, and basically it was if you had a mutation that if you needed two mutations or three mutations or four mutations or five mutations, they could happen in, I think it turns out to be like the square root of two or the square root of three or the square root of four or the square root of five times the original number, which is not all that long. And Douglas Axe kind of, uh, Axe kind of smelled a, a rat here somewhere, and so he looked at the mathematics and traced Lynch's and Abegg's change to two erroneous equations, both of which were based on an erroneous assumption. If you start with those equations, you get Lynch's numbers. But if the equations are wrong, of course, the conclusions are wrong. In essence, Lynch and Ebeg calculated the waiting times required to produce such structures as if a process for locking in potentially advantageous changes did exist and as if their undirected and purely random mechanism was in some way directed to these functionally propitious outcomes. As Axe noted, notes in a trenchant mathematical critique of Lynch's and Ebeg's argument, of all the possible evolutionary paths a population can take, the analysis of Lynch and Ebeg considers only those special paths that lead directly to the desired end, the complex adaptation. Uh, basically, Lynch and Ebeg did with their mathematics what Dawkins had done earlier with his methinks it is like a weasel um, uh, computer program. And yes, it does shorten the time considerably, but it uh, it does so at the expense of being realistic in terms of biology. Then there's Neo-Lamarckian epigenetic inheritance, largely championed today by Eva Jablonski of Tel Aviv University and Massimo Piglusi of the City University of New York. And the problem with this is that by its nature, macroevolution requires stable, meaning permanently heritable, changes. But Jablonski's evidence shows that where non-genetic inheritance occurs in animals, it involves structures that either A, do not change, such as membrane patterns and other persistent templates of structural information, or B, do not persist over more than several generations. Uh, shades of the second commandment uh, under the third and fourth generation. Um, natural genetic engineering, uh, perhaps the most interesting scenario. We someday may review James Shapiro's book if we have, if, uh, depending on what happens. Um, University of Chicago geneticist James Shapiro has formulated another post-Darwinian perspective on how evolution works that he calls natural genetic engineering. Shapiro has developed an an understanding of evolution that takes account of the integrated complexity of organisms as well as the importance of non-random mutations and variations in the evolutionary process. And you're going, non-random, how does that work? Well, let's explain that. As an example of regulated mutation, 
Shapiro observes that in response to environmental assaults, UV damage from sunlight or the presence of an antibiotic, for instance, bacteria activate what is known as the SOS response system. And a little more on this system. This system makes use of specialized DNA polymerases that are prone to errors that are normally not used. They're left unexpressed. And they are synthesized and set into action, allowing the population to generate a much wider range of genetic variation than usual in response to this kind of stress. Bacterial cells regulate this process by using a DNA binding protein known as LEX-A, which normally represses these error-prone uh, polymerases. When the SOS system is activated by environmental damage, the production of LXA first drops dramatically, allowing these things to be expressed, um, but then rises, which ensures that as soon as DNA repair occurs, LexA will reaccumulate and repress the SOS genes. This system allows cells to replicate DNA that, carry, that carries unrepaired damage keeping their essential replication machinery moving past a stall in the absence of, of which the bacterium would die. But it also does one other thing that is not mentioned in Steve Meyer's book, but that is mentioned in Shapiro's book, and that is it causes more mutations in this situation, which means that if there is going to be an advantageous mutation, it is more likely to happen in this setting, an advantageous mutation in the sense of helping the bacterium get through this particular rough patch where it's being attacked by ultraviolet light or antibiotics or so forth. During the last 15 years, Shapiro has published a series of fascinating papers about the newly discovered capacities of cells to direct or engineer the genetic changes they need to remain viable in a range of environmental conditions. His work represents a promising avenue of new biological research, bringing insight into how the cells information processing system modifies and directs the expression of genetic information in real time with response to different signals. And I might add that there's one particular part of this that is well known to most uh, uh, people who deal with medicine, and that is the immune system, where there are deliberately areas uh, that are cut and pasted into uh, another area to generate antibodies that have all kinds of different specificities and those of course are done by DNA so that they're inheritable so that the cell can then produce a clone if necessary to fight off a particular um, uh, say bacterial target or something like that. So antibodies are directed evolution if you want to think of it that way. They're probably the most obvious example of it. Um, uh, again, that's uh, something I'm adding to the book. Um, but Steve um, Meyer finishes with the question, where does the program programming come from that accounts for pre-programmed -pro pre adaptive capacity of living organisms? If, as James Shapiro argues, natural selection and the exclusively random mutations don't produce this information, rich pre-programming, then what did? In the next chapters, I'll propose an answer to precisely this question. And that finishes those two chapters. Um, my take on this is Darwinian evolution was originally proposed as a design substitute. That's what it was to do, to explain why eyes and ears looked like they were intended to do something. It requires three elements, random variations and mutations, or mutations, natural selection and heredity. And natural selection does work, but can be too weak, and random mutations require, frankly, too much luck. So uh, none of the substitutes surveyed can overcome the problem of the problems with explaining the Cambrian explosion by undirected processes alone. The closest, I think, is James Shapiro, but his scenario implies a massively complex initial organism, 
and basically takes the problem of the Cambrian explosion and shoves it back on the origin of life. Now, all of this work by Meyer is negative work, um, but we will get into the positive starting next week. But that's my take. Now it's your turn. Nobody else wants to say anything. I'll say something. <clears throat> I, I'm impressed with this chapter. Uh, you might feel it's negative, but it uh, touches on all the major attempts to try and explain this, and they all seem to ignore the uh, initial complexity uh, that is necessary for even the simplest organism or these other changes they propose afterwards you know like uh, well you can have these super genes uh, these design genes and so on uh, evo devo uh, what you want you can have this uh, but man how are they going to get these complex things to start out with, they just put in a superficial cover on top of a major problem. And so I, I, uh, I it's a very good chapter to summarize uh, the dilemma of evolution here. It's, 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 I mean, it's, why not, why not think in terms of a designer for a change? How long are you going to persist to trying one thing after another, after another, after another, and you get nowhere? Well, it's very simple. They're not interested in a designer because they know where it goes. Go, okay. <laughs> All I can say is reality is reality. Uh, this is, you know, fairly good scientific data here and so on. Except, uh, <laughs> I don't. You don't call it data. This is a, a superficial cap on data. Well, some of it's data. Like, for example, the idea that uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, the Hox gene distal less functions yeah, in three totally different ways in three diff totally different organisms. Mm -hmm. You know, it says grow whatever it is here. Obviously, you need to have, and, and see, this is one of the problems is that uh, if you have Hox genes and you want to, uh, and you, now you want to grow whatever, you have to develop the genes around the Hox gene that are going to tell you uh, <coughs> what kind of an appendage to grow. You know, is it tube feet? Is it spines? Well, then okay. you have to have the tube feet and the spine genes or whatever they are and probably multiple different kinds of genes. On the other hand, if you want to grow legs, you have to have the legs to grow. If you're going to grow, um, it'd be interesting to see because I don't think anybody's <coughs> Uh, well, at least it hasn't been widely publicized, if, if it has been done. Um, but I bet you fins on fish probably come from the, uh, the distal S gene as well. Well, some of the eye, uh, you might call it designer genes, do produce eyes in different organisms. Yeah, and if you, so and you, if you activate them in this, <coughs> you can put eyes on shoulders of organisms, for example. Yes, uh, you can put eyes on legs of flies and so on by moving these genes around. Uh, but uh, this is so simplistic uh, 
compared to the complexity of the process that's going on. It just leaves you, uh, you know, gasping almost for how, how, uh, how can you make all these jumps here uh, in this thing. It's a good chapter. The thing I found interesting was that Sindewolf said, well, the reason why there are no intermediates is because there were no intermediates. And nobody apparently pounced on him for that statement. They had nothing else to go on. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, gives you the, which gives you the idea that, um, as Stephen Jay Gould put it, the uh, absence of uh, intermediate forms is a trade secret of paleontology. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, this is the saltation model was so ridiculed. Uh, at first, it's, he points out Gould tried to avoid it, but uh, you, let's face it, you try, after you try so many things, start thinking about God. I think you've got the mic now. Okay. I agree with Dr. Oath that this is a brilliant chapter. Actually, it's two chapters, to be Actually, fair. two. They, they dovetail together, don't they? Um, Stephen Meyer, if he were an attorney and arguing a legal case, he would have won his case by now. Uh, brilliant uh, defense of his position, and, and he really tears apart the other. Now, an observation I have in all of these controversies, and we've talked about a lot of them, Sometimes it's easier to poke holes in our opponent's armor and find where all the weak spots are and then tear everything apart, tear apart models, mm -hmm. than to present a model that's from a more positive sense. And I think he was, was he promising at the end of these two chapters to present something more positive? Yes, the next chapter is entitled, I think, Intelligent Design. Um. Yeah, I haven't looked at it yet. I have it here. <coughs> yeah, possibility of intelligent design. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to see the... And by the way, it doesn't look like it, we're that far along, but in fact, uh, you have to remember that this part from about here on is notes and bibliography and whatnot, so... We're uh, uh, 17, 18, 19, and 20, and we're done. Yeah. Um, I know he's not dealing with geology, and that's, of course, my uh, big interest. I think from a flood geology standpoint, it's easier to tear apart the current model of geology. But you have to turn that around and say that uh, those who are promoting the current model have sometimes a heyday tearing apart some of the flood geology arguments. So there, it's on both sides that we're, we're looking for the uh, chinks mm. in the armor and we're trying to plunge that sword in and, and make a fatal blow. But I think Stephen Meyer, this is impressive. He's done it about as well as anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I would just uh, add to your comment, uh, which, which, uh, I, which I agree with in the, in the flood geology area. Uh, Adventism and might say creation and so on have done a lot better in the biological area than they have in the geological area. And we've got a serious complication of uh, is there anything to the geologic column? And uh, this is still being discussed in the last uh, issue of Journal Creation. Uh, uh, s there are quite a number of creationists who still deny there's any order in the geologic column. And uh, that, that's a field day for the evolutionists. <laughs> uh, uh, because man, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, you know, you, you can't find a single mammal in the whole Grand Canyon series. Uh, that, that says something, folks. <laughs>
Uh, and uh, need to keep in mind that there seems to be some order to that geologic column. Yeah, and I read those articles already and just came out this last week. Um, to deny that there's an order, overall order in the geological record is similar to saying that, well, I won't accept Linnaeus' classification system uh, for the whole organic world. I'll just, uh, because it's all based on evolution, see. Which, of course, it wasn't because Linnaeus was a creationist. Exactly. And same way with the geological column. It was developed before Darwin even um, published page one of his uh, at least published uh, thesis in the origins. So it was also developed before Lyell, which is probably more pertinent. That is now more the, pertinent. I, I will ask, um, uh, where does Hutton fit with uh, the uh, uh, with the geologic column in terms of what? Hut what Hutton was first? the theorist, so he lived in the um, 18th century, and not so much 19th. The geological column came along pretty much in very, very early in the 19th century. So Hutton was arguing uh, the uniformity of processes and endless time. And then the column was developed. Once he broke it open that there could be endless time, then uh, you could develop the column with natural processes rather than catastrophic. I will point out that it's now 11:30, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think some people have places that they need to be. But but it, it's interesting that you have a lot of these parallel issues. Whether you dip into um, macrobiology or microbiology, <laughs> looking at the cell, there's a a basis that you have to go with, and that's design. Even in geology, when we mention the column, there's some kind of design there. And we're trying to figure it out, you know, and how to fit it in a much shorter chronology than we're taught. But there is a design there. Well, I, I, will, say, I will say a couple of things. Number one is if Meyer's critique is accepted, the rules of the game are changed. Uh, because if there is a designer, and that designer is uh, big enough to, to create the universe, that, that's, let's say that that's the straightforward the implication of the Big Bang Theory. Once you have a designer, you have to say, well, he did it. And, uh, and if, uh, if that designer is capable of interfering in his creation, which it seems like if you're going to grant the Cambrian explosion, you're pretty much stuck with that. Then, if you want to know what happened, it's far more important to know the designer's intentions mm -hmm. than it is to know natural law. And so the rules of the game have just been changed tremendously. And I th this is, I think, the thing that makes uh, the, much of the scientific community so afraid of intelligent design. Because if they lose, they don't just lose, oh, well, an intelligent designer came in and did this and that and whatever. Suddenly, you've got to ask, well, what else did he do? <coughs> uh, I think that the second thing that is important in this situation is that although it hasn't happened as often as it should. There have been situations where people went in with a short age perspective and started saying, well, if, we, if short age is really true, we should find evidences for it. And those were done probably most prominently and successfully right now in the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, where the paradigm has been basically turned around. And I think that the second one is uh, that carbon-14 dating, in particular, was one where 
there's an article out there that says, and if you believe creationism, here are the models you can choose from, and they should be tested, and especially some of them that give predictions different from the standard model. And at least two of those areas have been tested and have shown results that are pretty significant and different from the, what the standard model would predict. So I think that we're starting to answer that kind of question. I would also put in that category um, <coughs> Leonard Brand's studies on the um, uh, on, on the uh, animal tracks in the Coconino. Uh, and, and finally, although it's more reactive probably than predictive, but I imagine there's been some prediction to it. I think that the soft sediment deformation uh, in the case of uh, uh, paraconformities, mm -hmm. I think is, a, uh, is an area where uh, perhaps not quite as intentionally, but certainly with the same effect that we're starting to see that kind of thing where, you know, you have sandstone coming in on shale and the shale is oozing up in between the sandstone. The sandstone is coming down in blobs in the middle of the shale. Yeah. And uh, the shale has supposed to have been sitting there for uh, 6 million, 10 million, whatever, years and not getting eroded at the same time. You know, there's something wrong here. Uh, and I, so I think that we are starting to have uh, important things where we are able to, you know, kind of call the shot and hit it. Uh, it's not as much as it perhaps should be, but uh, maybe that's uh, for lack of our imagination as to what we should be shooting at. I have a question for you, Paul. Last evening, I thought of you last evening. Um, I was surfing the web looking for creationist arguments. Anyway, there's this, uh, this report of perfectly normal wood being preserved, and it's like 30, 40 million years old in the Arctic. You know what I'm talking about, this island, Axel Heiberg, I think. And there's some other islands up there with fossil wood. Now, and and uh, my understanding is that some of that would uh, has made its way to Southern Adventist University. Yes. Now, what the question I have, it was reported that scientists have now done isotopic studies. And they've looked at uh, O18 and they've looked at some other things there and trying to decipher what kind of environment was. It was a very uh, humid, very rich atmospherically rich environment that would produce rapid growth. That's the way it was reported. And then they had about one or two sentences there saying, and some samples were sent to a lab and dated with carbon-14 and expecting to show infinite age because it's so old. Right, there shouldn't and, be any carbon-14 in it. And huh? then it said a creationist was standing there watching the dating process this is an unnamed creationist, watching the process, and it came out with a date of 41,000 years. That's on the web. Now, do you know anything <laughs> about, or I, you, are you connected with that? I had, <laughs> not, I had not heard of that particular piece of information. Yeah, I, um, I do know that the stuff at Southern Adventist, they have contacted me and said, what should we do to get it yeah. dated? And I've given them some advice okay. trying to, you know, it may uh, be referring to that. There are no names, no footnotes. Uh, well, th they haven't done the, the Southern Adventist stuff yet. Okay. They, were, they sent it to a lab, whatever was sent to a lab, to use that as a test for infinite age and to uh, check the equipment out for contamination. You know how they do with coal, uh, especially can, Pennsylvania Can you send me coal. the, the uh, web reference for that? I will. I'll... Find it, uh, you know. Because I'm collecting those things to, uh, eventually I'm, I'm intending to create an article that will summarize the, you know, all of 
all of the references that have been uh, that have been done to this kind of thing. So forty-one thousand years is within the range of carbon dating. Obviously. Oh, easily, easily. Yeah. Um, just roughing it out. Uh, Fifty-two is about point two uh, percent. Point. Let's see. It's. Point zero two, I think. No. Point two percent. I think it's point zero two. I think it's point. Uh, no, it's not, because that uh, those are really high. Zero point anyway. two. Zero point two percent modern okay. carbon. In and which case, forty one would be about zero point eight more or less. Okay. Percent modern carbon, uh, which is really a significant. Uh, I mean, most laboratories, um, if you take let's say graphite, that if you just put it on the machine, it dates 0.04%. Um, and then you, you burn it and then you reduce it again, uh, which is basically kind of doing a machine blank. So you, you, you have an idea of how much contamination you have during your processing. The processing turns out to be about 0.2%. 0 0.14, 0 0.26, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range. Uh, I, I, I know this because <laughs> I, I was just in the middle of an internet discussion where, uh, where the, these uh, people were using that kind of, those kind of numbers to try to, to, try to discredit uh, Baumgartner's at all data. Um, but, uh, but in this case, you know, if you're looking at 0.8%, then that's well beyond the 0.2%. And it's, by the way, where the best dinosaur, uh, best meaning lowest, dinosaur data is. So it's, it's reasonable from a creationist standpoint, and it's not really reasonable from a, uh, from a uh, long age standpoint. That's about the same date that you get for the uh, coal there in um, the Cretaceous coals in Utah. Oh, that we've all seen. Uh, but um, I would uh, say uh, in connection with the main topic of this chapter, we need to keep in mind here that uh, evolutionists have known about the Cambrian explosion for a century and a half, almost two centuries. Uh, it's amazing how much those earlier folks knew about the fossil record. I, 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 I get surprised that they knew what was going on there. And Darwin knew also, of course, <laughs> uh, and so on. But, and they haven't changed their mind yet uh, in spite of the problems there. So uh, let's keep in mind uh, patience is a virtue. Well, that, and I think that uh, there are some decision factors that are not related directly to the strength of argument and the strength of evidence. And I think that's something yeah. to keep in mind. And that's I think right. one of these days that will be demonstrated a little, more, uh, a little more obviously. Science has a strong sociological component. <clears throat> anyway, come back to uh, next week and we'll get into the positive what Steve Meyer actually thinks might have happened.